Hi, everyone. Welcome back again. Laszlo Montgomery here at your service for the 207th time and counting with another gem from Chinese history, modern Chinese history this time. Here in the Home of the Brave, we celebrate Labor Day every first Monday in September since the 1880s. It's a holiday to honor the working people of this amazing country. So this episode is dedicated to all those working men and women who this holiday commemorates. I guess if you go back to the time of the pyramids or the Dead Sea Scrolls, workers always get short shrift in the history books. And that's just the way it is. Great workers from Chinese history. I haven't found that book yet on Amazon. The workers, the peasants, as a collective term, they got written into the history books. Generals, politicians, orators, industrialists, leaders, revolutionaries. I guess that's what we're all interested to know more about. The workers, the peasants, a general catch-all term has always sufficed for them. The title of this episode was going to be the Chinese Labor Corps, but as I was saving the MP3 file, I added the term forgotten. The Forgotten Chinese Labor Corps. Being Labor Day here and all, I thought it would be a timely topic to look at. CHP listeners heard about them in other episodes. These Chinese workers sent to Europe during World War I to aid the Allies in their fight against the Germans. I thought today we'd dig a little deeper than in past episodes and take some time out to recognize these forgotten men. A lot of them died in the course of carrying out some really heroic deeds that... Well, had they been carrying a weapon instead of a shovel or a set of tools, well, they would have been honored with medals and glory. An unknown number of them breathed their last quietly on the battlefield with their heroism unnoticed and unrecorded. A couple of years ago, I was in Paris for this documentary on Robert Fortune. It's called The Tea Thief. When I was done filming, I went and goofed off for the day and took a walk through Père Lachaise Cemetery to go see Jim Morrison and Frederick Chopin's graves and others. And I was surprised to see, walking through that cemetery, so many Chinese graves. Quite a few. So many, in fact. I wondered, how did they get here so long ago? Some of the graves had dates of death from the 40s and 50s. Well, I don't know for sure the story behind each name, but... The first major wave of Chinese migration to uh, France happened during this time we're looking at today. In France's case, several thousand men from the Chinese Labor Corps never went back to China, built a life in France, and that's where their relatives are today. Over half a million ethnic Chinese in La France. A lot of them are descendants of these 3,000 or so Chinese Labor Corpsmen. Their story takes place between 1916 and 1922, the Great War years. For China, it was a time to look back in anger. The bad luck streak going back to the Opium Wars had modern China back on its heels like never before. The last imperial dynasty had fallen in 1911, and it had been five years of trying to figure out what to do while the foreign powers were feathering their nests in their respective spheres of influence in China. Then came Yuan Shikai's perfidy and the resulting slide into warlordism, how the foreign powers feasted. You'll probably recall those years immediately after the fall of the Qing dynasty were messy indeed. No smooth transition from 2100 years of imperial rule to a constitutional democracy. Too great a leap to take in one fell swoop. So once again... It was a case of the empire long divided, must unite. Long united, must divide. China had more than three decades of living on Payne Street in front of them. July 28th, 1914, was the official start of World War I. Archduke Ferdinand and his missus gunned down on the streets of Sarajevo. The battle lines were drawn and the war to end all wars began. Germany and Austria-Hungary on the one side and the French, British, and Russians on the other. I'm sure all of you studied the history of the Great War. Lots of podcasts about that, not to mention books and movies, too. I won't rehash it for you. Less than two weeks after war was declared, China let the world know they were neutral in this conflict. And that's key to this story. Chinese authorities went to great lengths at the beginning to express that they had no dog in this fight. And later on, when the French and British start taking on the CLC, or Chinese Labor Corps workers, 
they too tried to show this was all being handled by non-government private parties and they didn't have anything to do with it and whatever these clc workers were doing it certainly had nothing to do with combat or fighting against kaiser wilhelm the china government saw how the country was being economically crushed to death by the financial weight of these boxer war indemnities and besides this it was common knowledge in the cities at least that china was being utterly humiliated by the foreign powers who had each carved out their own little turf and ran it how they liked in defiance of any chinese protest not like today the 21 demands from japan that later became the 13 demands showed china they shouldn't expect too much as far as asian solidarity against the western imperialists and the china government because of the pitiful financial and political situation they found themselves in had to stand by and say nothing but one guy had an idea about how to possibly crawl out from under this pathetic state of affairs and when the summer of 1914 came he saw some good that could possibly come of this european war his name was liang shi yi he was someone high up in the yuan shi kai government and later a finance minister and a premier of china in 1921-22 uh, during the beiyang government he was also remembered for his participation in the treaty signed with the british in 1906 that gave the qing government chinese sovereignty over tibet with germany now at war with france and britain and for the time being russia it opened the door to a possible resolution to the whole german question up in shandong shandong is the star of our episode this province took front and center stage in 1914 when the germans who had occupied Qingdao since 1891 got booted out by japan militarily in november 1914 the thinking in some circles in beijing was that well in the event of the germans going down in defeat if china threw their lot in with the allied powers france germany russia well there might be something in it for them come the peace treaty and the one thing china wanted was shandong there were plenty of humiliations for china to deal with at that time but this one the german and later japanese occupation of eastern shandong that really stuck in their craw but japan got real comfy in Qingdao, and that place became the proverbial toehold into china that later led to the mukden and marco polo bridge incidents and the whole second sino-japanese war so liang shi yi he went around to the brits first and tried to shop his idea of offering chinese support in the war against the kaiser in so many words liang was told you know thanks but no thanks we got the whole thing covered at that point so early in the game britain didn't feel any need to invite china into the club and possibly later on be obligated to share in the spoils militarily china couldn't have been weaker and more unreliable they didn't have much to contribute on that end but there was one thing liang shi yi saw as china's possible salvation and getting a seat at the victory table and coming out of this war better off than they were at present liang shi yi knew there was one thing china had a lot of going back to the beginning of time they had a lot of manpower these were the nameless individuals who in their great numbers built the great wall du jiang yen the grand canal the tea horse road the stone cattle road and thousands of other engineering feats into the present day they knew how to build and move the earth around well yang shi yi didn't have much luck in the beginning he tried to sell his idea as a combination of laborers and soldiers but when he changed his pitch to laborers only there was some interest but no takers yet but world war one was just getting started and after the battle of ardennes and the first battle of ypres all of a sudden the british and french top brass saw well this war was not going to be like past wars the death and carnage was shocking as the best weapons technologies of the industrial revolution got a nice first test drive on the battlefield suddenly fit male subjects who could put on a uniform and fight it became a much rarer commodity and a british or french soldier couldn't be wasted on jobs that didn't involve fighting on the battlefield 
Therefore, those who spurned him at first came around when Liang Shiyi, in the early summer of 1915, knocked on their door again about that offer of supplying Chinese workers to help in the war effort. He made an offer of supplying 300,000 Chinese workers to perform any and all non-combat duties. Britain was still mulling it over when France became the first to take Liang up on his offer. They had already started recruiting men from their colonies in North Africa, Indochina, and Madagascar. And paramount at this early stage was that appearances had to be kept up at all times, and that China was in no way negotiating with the British or French governments. Middlemen were used as a cover to throw the Germans off the scent. Liang Shiyi set up a firm called the Huimin Company that served as a one-stop shop for all your Chinese laborer needs and acted surreptitiously as a cover for the China government. They kept offices in Tianjin, Qingdao, Hong Kong, and Nanjing. They cast their net as far and wide as Guangxi, Yunnan, and Sichuan. But at the end of the day, of all the Chinese who served in the CLC, about 80% of them came from Shandong province. In the first deal, France signed on for 32,000 men. As per the terms of the contract, these workers were to only perform non-combat roles. A lot of hay was made about these Chinese nationals enjoying the same rights and privileges of their brethren from other nations, including France and Britain. You know, same pay for same work, same food, days off, working hours. The China government was trying to do the best for their people. But the truth was, they weren't treated very well. Some places were worse than others, but the stories of the Chinese worker always pulling the short straw, eh, there's a lot of them. Even amongst the Chinese themselves, some call these CLC recruits, Mai Chu Tsai, pigs that are sold. Eh, if they weren't going to get any respect from the Chinese, the foreigners sure as heck weren't going to. The French authorities signed five-year deals for these workers. They were to do volunteer and civilian work only. They would have nothing to do with direct military operations. The first group set sail from Tianjin in July 1916, just as the Battle of the Somme was ramping up. Boy, were these Chinese Labor Corps guys going to come in handy. About a million souls were going to perish on both sides of that battle by the time it ended. They arrived at the port city of Marseille in August... Riding along with the Chinese laborers were a whole smattering of missionaries and other students who served as interpreters. Not only couldn't any of these workers speak English, they were by and large right off the farm and illiterate as well. Well, like I said, all kinds of efforts were made to make this whole matter of thousands and thousands of Chinese heading in the direction of France, you know, look as innocuous as possible. All kinds of excuses were made, and the French authorities would point at their little fig leaves and say, see, see, nothing going on. But the Germans, well, if it walked like a duck and talked like a duck, they knew what it was. They carried out their own countermeasures to appeal to prospective CLC recruits not to throw their lives away on this. They spread lies, propaganda, and fear, but still, well, the prospect of five years guaranteed income for themselves and their family kept the volunteers coming. Germany wanted everyone to know they meant business, and on February 17, 1917, the steamship Athos, with 1,900 on board, was sunk by a German U-boat off the coast of Malta. So close to Marseille, yet so far. 543 of the 754 who went down with the ship were these Chinese laborers. It sank in 14 minutes. The German Navy prowled the Mediterranean and did their best to make the general area unsafe for Allied shipping. So new routes had to be established to keep this flow of workers coming. After the Somme, the man shortage really began to manifest itself in all kinds of ways. Britain and France had, at first, turned their nose up at accepting assistance from China. Now they were relying on it heavily. There was a lot more to the war business than fighting and killing. The alternative, newer and safer route to get these Chinese to Europe saw these laborers set sail from China across the Pacific to Vancouver. And from Vancouver, it was a long nine-day train ride to Halifax in a cattle car through the mountains, across the plain, 
before boarding a vessel for the final straight shot across the Atlantic. Britain followed France's model and signed up their own lot of CLC workers. British recruited them out of their sliver of Shandong at Wei Hai Wei. Like the French, the British paid a portion of the salary direct to the men and a portion to their family. Terms and conditions were agreed to regarding the treatment of the men, but like with the French, there was a lot of wiggle room. And the way the chaos and destruction was, you know, the Chinese didn't have a convenient channel to air their grievances. By the time the British made up their mind to recruit these workers, they ended up having a much harder time. The volunteers weren't coming in the same droves as with the French. With recruitment numbers abysmally low, the British government turned to their secret weapon, the North China Missionary Community, to act as their sales and marketing team. And these missionaries, saving souls out in the most remote parts of North China, were able to send the British a lot of business. And by January 1917, the first lot were on their way to Blighty. The British only signed the men up for three-year stints. They gave them a similar deal as the French. At the end of the day, if you had to pick one, the French were better to work for. And there was one glaring difference between signing a contract with the French and signing with the British. At the conclusion of the five-year term, the French government invited the workers to stay on and become French. The British, after the end of the three-year term, uh, they said, This way to the exits. There was one loud and vociferous group who were dead set against bringing in these foreign workers, especially from China. And these were the labor groups of France and England. They were, I guess you could say, a rough lot, and prone to violence, and familiar in the ways of persuading their politicians to look out for their interests. So the British worker didn't want to compete with some Chinese import who was willing to work five times as hard for half the pay. So there was this playing out in the background. And I want to emphasize this. There was always this resistance, and it slowed things down and complicated the transport logistics, and in all the cases, the Chinese volunteer felt the brunt of the consequences of appeasing domestic labor interests. A quick word about the voyage over. Now, I'm not going to say these Chinese labor corps volunteers had it as bad as the African slaves who came to America in chains, but there were many aspects of this journey taken by their Chinese brothers, that would have been most recognizable. And whenever the ships would dock in Vancouver or Halifax or anywhere, the Chinese had to stay on board. It was a pretty brutal and dehumanizing voyage for these guys who, as I said, knew nothing except livestock and the seasonal day-in, day-outs of farming. A lot of them died on the way or were seasick for the whole voyage. I once did an overnight ferry back in 1980 from Qingdao to Shanghai, and the misery was so total and my seasickness so horrible. Even after 38 years, I could still remember how wretched that endless evening was. Well, some of the Chinese labor corpsmen even committed suicide. They just jumped overboard and died in the ocean. They had taken this adventure as far as they could, and for some of them, that's where it prematurely ended. Between March 1917 and March 1918, 84,000 CLC volunteers had made that voyage and had done the Vancouver to Halifax train ride. By the time they docked in Liverpool or Plymouth, you can imagine what kind of shape they were in. The killing fields awaited them. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. They may have been involved in non-combat duties, but actual combat and non-combat duties have a way of mixing all the time. And into 1917, as the deaths kept escalating and more and more bodies needed burying and trenches needed to be dug and wreckage and mines and unexploded ordnance scattered everywhere had to be cleared and cargo needed to be unloaded at the port and rushed to the front. That was a 24-7 job by 1917. By April of that year, there were already 35,000 CLC workers operating in Europe under contract to the British. By the time of the last batch of workers sent in March 1918, the total number recruited by the British was about 94,400 of these China labor corpsmen, 34,000 more than the French. And these Chinese men, who nobody wanted at first, something like 130, 140,000 of them ended up serving in the Allied war effort. 
But the demand went way beyond that figure. In the end, the problem was getting them from China to the European continent. It was always a logistics issue that got in the way. There were never enough ships by then. The first contingent of Chinese workers contracted by the British arrived in early April 1917. The British had most of their CLC workers right there supporting the front lines. They were all held in camps spread out on the French and Belgian side of the English Channel. They got to have floor seats to a lot of what was happening in the trenches. They lived a regimented barracks life and did everything a soldier did except carry a weapon and fight. In addition to any and all manners of manual labor, they served as mechanics also, fixing everything from tanks on down to the simplest devices. <laughs> you know, these guys worked hard, but if they were back home in Shandong or Hebei or Shanxi, well, it's not like they'd be taking it easy. Their muscle labor, this was their skill, and they put it to great use in the service of the French and British war effort. The French, as opposed to the British, they had a different use for their Chinese workers. The French labor groups fought this tooth and nail, but where most of these guys ended up was in the factories and at the ports and depots. So many French soldiers had been killed. I mean, they had to empty the factories to get men into those trenches. So this was how the Chinese were utilized by and large. So you could say, eh, better a five-year deal with the French than three years in the service of the British. It was less harsh. The French CLC workers... More than half of them worked far away from the front. Another bit of reality that kept the pot of misunderstandings and hard feelings boiling all the time in France. Well, there weren't enough interpreters. It's not like today. You know, not being able to understand each other led to problems that caused both sides to get equally furious and outraged with each other. And this did wonders to help fuel racism, xenophobia, and a general negative opinion about the Chinese workers. Abuses of all kinds happened regularly. There was systemic prejudice and getting ripped off with pay and then fighting with it, the Algerian workers. In the face of all this abuse, unfair treatment, and general lack of respect, the Chinese made attempts to remedy their situation. They tried strikes and organized resistance, but it was to no avail. Zhou Enlai and the Chinese emigres who helped bring the communists to power in 1949, they would arrive in France you know, towards the end of 1920, but they became familiar rather quickly about organizing and knew all about the exploitation of these CLC workers. After March 14, 1917, China broke diplomatic relations with Germany, so it was okay for this secret that everyone knew about to be out in the open. The Allies threw China a bone and said the boxer indemnities could be deferred for now. Well, five months later, China declared war on Germany. In for a penny, in for a pound. The halls of power in Republican China must surely have been feeling pretty good about the post-war prospects for China. It sure was going to be nice to get Shandong back. Even more forgotten than these Chinese labor corps workers were the 200,000 Chinese men sent to work in Russia. A lot of them helped to build the Murmansk Railway. Russia, like Britain and France, ran out of men too, fighting on the Eastern Front. So these Chinese workers helped to fill that vacuum. They were all present during the October Revolution and witnessed everything that followed. Now when the Americans entered the war, they too had to borrow 12,000 CLC workers to help keep their armies marching. The U.S. Army handed them back to France in May of 1919. The Yanks weren't any better to work for than the Brits, though they were considered the lesser of two evils. No matter who they were contracted to, France, Great Britain, a lot of hay was made about the CLC not being fighters, you know, a warrior who carried a weapon. But the truth was, the way the battles went, they got blown up too, stepped on mines, got wounded by shrapnel, disabled, severely disabled. They saw plenty of action all the time. No one knows for sure how many died. A few thousand, ten thousand, more. It was hard to keep track. And from what I read, keeping stats on how many uh, from the CLC got killed or maimed wasn't a top priority. Amidst all the horror and barbarism of World War I and the challenges faced by these CLC men, there was the occasional bright spot. It's not like no one cared about them. Beyond these 
hundreds of interpreters and minders, there were also groups who saw the plight of these laborers and sought to give them hope, some love, some care. There were two groups in particular who rose to the fore, and these were the YMCA in England and the work-study movement in France. The brainchild of a man named Li Shizhong. He was a famous anarchist, anti-communist, who came to France at the turn of the century, and in 1906 studied at the Pasteur Institute and built a life there, assimilated, and in 1912, after living in Paris for so many years, he championed this organization to teach other Chinese in France how to speak the French language, how to act, how to take care of themselves. You know, it, it became a safe haven of support. And they encouraged these men to be sober, stay away from the opium pipe, gambling, prostitution. It taught them all about the West and the ways of the Westerners and about the importance of education, science, and you know, all kinds of things. And Li Shizhong ultimately hoped these common, low-born men who participated in this work-study movement would one day go back to China and spread the word and bring some of this good that France had to offer back to the home country and that China might possibly benefit from this. When, starting in 1916, 1917, with all these Chinese laborers arriving in France en masse like they did, Li Shizhong imagined all the possibilities in scaling his idea to include this massive influx of Chinese. He put it this way, quote, Having been exposed to European civilization, they can help to reform society and eliminate undesirable habits. End quote. Yeah, Li Shizhong, I should do an episode on him one day. He organized schools to be set up around Paris where these men could go to. And these Chinese labor corpsmen, well, had they stayed back in China, they would remain illiterate till their dying day. But the work-study movement made a real contribution in opening the door of literacy to a lot of these workers. If at least a portion of the Chinese made strides in learning French and learning to read, well, they could at least help lift up and support those other workers in France who were struggling to keep their heads above water. He found them work inside the factories as well. It was a heck of a support group. There were magazines and pamphlets printed that gave these men both feature stories uh, about living in France as well as news on the war and from China. So the work-study movement and everything it did provided some solace to the thousands of Chinese far from home, surrounded by death and destruction. I mean, it provided them work, education, entertainment, services, comfort, and care. In England, they had the YMCA. Whereas in France, the work-study movement was secular in nature. In England, there was always the hope that in helping these Chinese CLC workers and bringing kindness and support to them, they might later on consider letting Jesus into their hearts. So for a whole lot of them, they were able to take what they learned from the French work-study movement and British YMCA, you know, from these organizations, and acquired a skill, or they became literate. So for more than a few China labor corpsmen, they returned to China better skilled than when they had left. Not profound, mind you, but it was profound to these individuals and how it gave them a leg up on you know, everyone else living in their county. Well, 11-11-1918, Kaiser Wilhelm abdicated, an armistice was signed, the war ended. All the superlatives, we heard them all before in other history podcasts. Sir Dan Carlin in particular with his Blueprint for Armageddon epic. 16 million died, 20 million wounded. That hardly tells the story. So the war ended, but the brave men in the CLC were still under contract. Five years for those who signed on with the French, and three years for those in the employ of the British. In May of 1919, there were still about 35,000 Chinese labor corpsmen remaining in France, and maybe another 45,000 working for the British, about 80,000 in all. As long as they were still on contract, there was still plenty of hard work for them to do. I mean, we're familiar with all the carnage, death, and destruction that happened during the Great War, but less is known about the cleanup. <laughs> yeah, all those mortar shells everywhere, mines, wrecked equipment, and burnt-out vehicles, dead trees, dead bodies, dead animals. I mean, during the war, 
the CLC workers dug miles and miles of trenches. Now they had to go fill them all in. The war was over and nobody needed these reminders anymore. The scale of the cleanup operation was enormous, and both countries were unable to replenish all their soldiers who perished. So the thankless task, the task that the history books and documentaries tend to leave out, the cleanup, it got done. By late October 1919, there were still as many as 50,000 workers still toiling away on the continent. British labor interests said thanks but no thanks to allowing the Chinese laborers on British soil. They'd handle the cleanup themselves, thank you very much. In France, it wasn't easy for the workers left stranded with time left on their contracts. They faced all manners of resentment and racism directed against them. Not from everyone, I'm sure, but the record shows the Chinese labor corps workers taking care of these unpleasant and dirty jobs. Uh, they weren't made to feel welcome. On the one hand, they were willingly taking on the reconstruction jobs that the local French were reluctant or unwilling to do. And on the other hand, the Chinese had to put up with the prejudice and all the ways, big and small, that this manifested itself in their daily life. It said these workers saved up over 51 million francs in French banks over the period of their labors. Over a three-year period, it was estimated each CLC worker could amass about 800 francs, 1,300 if it was a five-year contract. And this was in addition to the portion of their contracted salary that was paid directly to their families. You cannot imagine how profound this help was to a local village family struggling in the earliest days of Republican China. By September of 1920, the last of the stragglers of the 94,400 workers contracted to the British were shipped back to China. They weren't welcome to stay beyond their contract term. Another 73 perished on the voyage back. There are many descendants in Britain of these CLC workers, so I'm guessing some remained or came there later from France. In France... The last workers were repatriated back to China at the end of 1922. And as I said, there were roughly 3,000 Chinese Labor Corps workers who elected to begin life anew in La France. And again, from these men, the Parisian Chinese community received a huge boost. Many of the half million today can trace their arrival to France to these CLC workers. In France and Belgium, there were about 2,000 graves in four military cemeteries that uh, have the remains of uh, these CLC workers. And those who ended up there, no matter from poison gas, getting shot or blown up, or from TB, or later on the Spanish flu, their memories were dignified with four different common Chinese phrases randomly carved into all the headstones. Zhi si zhong cheng. Faithful until death. Jiu Fang Bai Shi, a good reputation endures forever. Yong Wang Zhi Qian, a noble duty bravely done. And Sui Si Yu Sheng, though dead, he still liveth. If they had the man's name and village, it was also carved on the gravestone. Every man had a unique five or six digit ID, and that got carved on the stone too. And if they didn't have anything except the number on their aluminum, identity bracelet that they all wore, then that was what they put on the gravestone, with the date of death, of course. We'll never know how many China labor corps men paid the ultimate sacrifice. Statistics vary from between 3,000 to 10,000. It's quite a disparity. So, Shandong province, China wanted it back. Germany was a vanquished nation, and after all, for crying out loud, Shandong was in China, Confucius' birthplace. Japan had been squatting in Qingdao since defeating the Germans in November 1914. Now, right was right, and Liang Shiyi's big gamble paid off, and China's participation on the side of the Allies got them that coveted seat at the Paris Peace Conference when it opened January 18, 1919, a delegation of 62 officials made the trip from China. Liang Shiyi, he knew, he knew if there was a way to get China into this war by hook or by crook, come the peace, China will at last be able to start undoing some of the more humiliating terms heaped on them by the Western powers in Japan. 
Well, I guess that was the punchline to the whole famous and tragic story. The famous Article 156 of the Peace Treaty, not only did China walk away from the conference disrespected and empty-handed regarding the status of Shandong in the years and decades that followed, everything the Chinese Labor Corps did to assist in the Allied war effort went unnoticed and became forgotten. And as we all know from previous episodes, the Chinese side refused to sign the treaty and walked out of the whole thing. They signed their own individual treaty with Germany to set things straight between them. Well, February 4th, 1922, the Washington Naval Conference, China ended up getting Shandong back from Japan. But the Japanese nationals who lived there were allowed to stay, and many enjoyed special rights and privileges. Over in Paris, Li Shizhong had this crazy dream that these Chinese labor corpsmen would take all this worldliness they gained, this literacy that many were able to achieve, and their exposure to these new ways of the West. He hoped they would be like ambassadors who could go back to China and spread the word and perhaps cause some sort of ripple effect in their niche in China. Well... Nothing of the sort happened. And if there were any stories of any of these men who went on to bigger and better things than plowing their fields, I couldn't find anything. And another thing, too. These poor guys, when they got back to their villages with their hard-earned savings, well, in rural China, whatever the returning son came back with in his pocket, well, by the time the last relative in the village got their vig, (laughs) there really wasn't much left over. Well, except for the memories, of course. For the first time in a hundred years, Britain, on November 11th, 2017, held a number of nationwide remembrance ceremonies to honor the CLC's service to the UK during the war. There's a movement to build a permanent monument to the Chinese Labor Corps in Britain. You can check out more details about that at ensuringweremember.org.uk. I'll have a link to that on the website. And on this Labor Day, here in the beautiful country, I wanted to introduce them to you, to all of you not familiar with this story. And if you ever find yourself in France or Belgium, maybe go leave some flowers on their graves and give them a thought. The Chinese Labor Corps, the Zhong Guo Lao Gong Lu. You know, I recommended them once before. Let me plug them again. Penguin Books in China. They have these penguin specials that are books short enough to read in a single sitting, you know, where you have an hour or two to kill. And one of these titles that came out in 2014 was on the Chinese Labor Corps that was written by Mark O'Neill. He also wrote books on the Empress Dowager Cixi and one about his grandfather, who was the inspiration for this book. His grandfather, Frederick O'Neill, was an Irish Presbyterian minister who served his flock up in Liaoning province in Manchuria. And during the period of the CLC's involvement on the European continent, he was one of those interpreters who served alongside them and got to know them, gave them solace, taught them the Bible, and gave them love while Armageddon was going on all around them. I'll have a link to that book on my website, Mark O'Neill, The Chinese Labor Corps. And go check out some of the other good stuff Penguin Specials has. So, a happy Labor Day to all my fellow Americanskis. You know, in our culture, Labor Day is considered the official end of the summer season. But uh, here in the City of Angels, we got plenty of summer left to go. On this holiday, I wanted to tell you all about the Chinese Labor Corps and hope you'll spare a thought for them during the holiday. I know I will. Okay, let's put the bookmark in here. I have another multi-episode CHP epic coming soon, maybe sooner than you think. Uh, If after 45 days or so you refresh your podcast feed and don't see anything from me, it's because I ended up working on the epic rather than letting you have a few standalones first. I'll think about it. For now, in preparation for the Labor Day weekend, coming up, I am going to go turn off my mind, relax, and float downstream. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California, beseeching you to join me next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.